Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this uh, rather un to what is it, a fourth or fifth hour meetings uh, this uh, semester. And uh, we will continue today. So I will first share the screen and um, hopefully that's gonna work. Yes, and um, uh, and um, uh, I we had a certain confusion last time concerning whether the uh, uh, whether the lecture was recorded or not. Uh, fortunately, it's automatically recorded, so uh, it is the record of our third lecture is already there, and we will begin a fourth lecture today. Uh, as you remember, we finished last uh, week uh, discussing the uh, influence of a uh, discovery of uh, mathematics the non-Riemannian geometry, Riemannian geometries, and uh, and uh, complex numbers in the literature and art of the second half of the nineteenth century, and um, the last uh, uh, item we discussed was uh, uh, a kind of a prediction of what's going to happen in the future on Earth uh, by Jerzy Żuławski in the last volume of his On a Silver Globe trilogy of the, in some sense, science fiction books uh, concerning the uh, expedition to the, to the moon and uh, consequences of it. So uh, today I will, uh, continue with this and uh, last week we were talking about the uh, how science proliferated through the quotation mark serious literature of the second half of a 19th century and the beginning of a 20th century but uh, at the same time there was a, a an explosion, so to say, of the literature, which today we will call a science fiction literature. And I would like to show you how that science uh, influenced the science fiction literature in the 19th century by picking up an example of a, of a, uh, of a, in some sense, a pope of the uh, science fiction literature of that period, French writer Jules Verne, uh, who lived, uh, uh, well, there's a zero missing here. And uh, this is a photograph of Jules Verne. He was a prolific writer. He wrote uh, lots of books, but uh, I would like to pick up a particular one, which is the third volume again of a trilogy of the, which starts with the thousand miles of the underwater uh, adventures of Captain Nemo. This is a, a story about the, uh, uh, which has been turned into a movie several times of a, a genial Indian engineer who built up uh, a giant, uh, submarine with which he was uh, roaming the oceans and uh, uh, his activity is discovered by his in collisions uh, more or less planned with the uh, military ships of the Great Britain and uh, it ends up and the story is that there's a French uh, scientist, Mr. Arnaud, who with his companion uh, accidentally almost get uh, saved from the 
uh, accident, that collision of this submarine, which is called Nautilus, with the uh, with the American uh, military ship Abraham Lincoln, and uh, uh, Arnoy is spending some time on the on that submarine, and he sees the life underwater uh, at the time. And it is still the case that uh, we have been doing lots of discoveries. We went to the moon and we have this tremendous knowledge of what is happening in the universe around us, uh, particularly in the 21st century due to the, this progress in satellite technology. But uh, we are much behind that in uh, our understanding of what is actually happening on the, in the deep of the uh, of the oceans, which uh, are a bigger part of our globe. The second volume of the uh, of the of the uh, trilogy I'm now discussing is the dot Childrens of Captain Grant. It's an uh, incredible story about the trip around the, around the world along a particular uh, um, uh, line on our globe. And, uh, but the third one is called the Mysterious Island. And it is uh, connected to the first volume by the uh, by the fact that the uh, but the bunch of uh, heroes of that book, American uh, 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 associated with uh, with during the uh, Civil War in United States in the 19th century with the North, uh, uh, which escapes by a balloon from the Richmond, from the capital of the Confederation is taken by the wind up on the, the ocean, on the Pacific Ocean, and it's the balloon crashed on the mysterious island. And uh, these people survived there, uh, mostly because uh, one of those uh, individuals in uh, the trip, this is a title book of, uh, the, the, the Mysterious Island edition. And uh, the one of the heroes of the, of, uh, one of these individuals is a uh, engineer, Cyrus Smith. And the whole book is actually the Cyrus Smith in action. He end up on the, uh, on the island, essentially without anything, with this crushed balloon, and he managed by his knowledge of the scientific discoveries of a 19th century, including uh, electricity, uh, he is uh, able to recreate a civilization of the, which at that time was in the United States and Great Britain. The, he builds up everything from the scratch uh, of course, with the help of his his uh, his friends, and the slight help of the unknown mysterious power, which helps them providing unexpected gifts in the form of boxes containing weapons or a boxes containing some tools which are necessary to build these pieces of the, uh, of the civilization. The, this mysterious uh, helper turns out to be Captain Nemo, the hero of the first volume, whose, un, whose submarine is uh, unfortunately locked inside of a cave under that island and cannot get out of that cave because the island is Volcanoes Island. And uh, the end of the book is the explosion of that uh, volcano, which destroys the island. And the 
and the submarine with it. And um, the explosion of the of the volcano in the mysterious island is, uh, if you read it now, it looks like what is description of what is happening now uh, on the Canary Islands in Las Palmas, where we are witnessing a disastrous explosion of a, of a, of a volcano, which successfully destroys a portion of that uh, otherwise a beautiful island. So there are some cartoons from that, from that book and the Cyrus Smith is, um, is, uh, is this, I, I mean, the book tells uh, the readers that don't worry, the, even in the worst possible conditions, if you, the science, the knowledge which we now have about the world around us and about the rules of the, which govern the nature, uh, allow us to uh, solve our problems and uh, will always allow the civilization to progress. In some sense, uh, it will be uh, nice to see the same message conveyed in the contemporary literature. We are uh, reading and seeing, on reading in the journals or reading, seeing in the television, and in particular the internet at this predictions of a climate catastrophe, which is uh, facing the civilization. And uh, that is of course a true prediction. We are having a serious problem, uh, but the, what is missing in the contemporary uh, view on it is that we, we, that we do have this enormous amount of our contemporary understanding of the nature around us. And we have this tremendous achievements of science of last 50 years or so. And there is absolutely no reason to worry. We have all the tools necessary to uh, prevent a disaster from happen. And uh, in some sense, we are missing a Cyrus Smith. And um, that is the message uh, which was in the science fiction literature of the 19th century, and in particular in the, in the books by Gilles Verne. Uh, and um, slowly, we are already in the 20th century, and uh, almost the rest of today's lecture if only, will be devoted to the phenomena related to the beginning of the century, uh, the year 1905, which is recorded in the uh, history of science as annus mirabilis, a miracle year of the scientific events. But in order to understand uh, the general uh, intellectual atmosphere of that time, it is worthwhile to look it up what, what was happening at the time, not only in, uh, in science. And the tremendous, uh, why I will now depart from the field of science and art and take you for a short trip over the history is that, as you will see, this was a year of uh, tremendous events which have ap appeared simultaneously and uh, they were in some sense related to each other. On the May of 25th of 95, uh, if you were reading a newspaper in, for example, uh, the Philadelphia Inquirer, you will see the front page main lead, Russia at war with Japan. 
the Japan uh, army have uh, surrounded a, a, a military base of a Russian Tsar you know, emperor, Imperium on the far east in the Korean town, which at the time was called the Port Arthur. And the Port Arthur was besieged by the Japanese army and the uh, Russian Tsar declared the war on Japan and the giant Baltic fleet uh, of uh, Russia uh, consisting of many battleships. And this is a picture of one of those battleships, the ironclad Sisoy Veliki underwent uh, start incredible trip. This is a map. So they start from the Baltic Sea, from the harbors in uh, next to Pat Peters and Petersburg. It is a military part of St. Petersburg called Kronstadt. And the fleet went all over the Baltic Sea, over the Danish Straits, and had to go via the La Manche Channel. And uh, the war almost started already here, where at the, uh, at the foggy day, this enormous fleet was identified by the German uh, Admiralty as the British fleet. And in, it thought this is the beginning of invasion. And uh, a few cannon salvos were exchanged between those two fleets, but fortunately uh, it has been clear that this was just a passing by the Armada, which went and it went all over the Bay of Biscay and uh, it split in two pieces, a smaller one with uh, Admiral Ferkarts, Fer, 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 went over the Mediterranean and Suez Canal and, uh, and the main one under the Admiral Rozestvinsky, who was the head of all the operation, went all over the Africa and those two fleets joined uh, on the north of Madagascar and continued toward Japan to liberate the Port Arthur, which is in here. Uh, this was enormous undertaking. Remember, this is the beginning of the 20th century. All those giant battleships and, and support vessels are coal powered. So that fleet had to stop all over to get the supplies of the coal. It uh, stops in Dakar, in somewhere in Gabon and, and in Cape Town and so forth. And eventually it crossed the Indian Ocean and get into this mess of islands here over the, 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 the next to Singapore and end up on close already to Japan in the Tsushima Straits. And then this enormous fleet was encountered by much smaller and uh, in considering a uh, weight and amount of guns and everything, inferior fleet of the Japan. And this giant Russian fleet was completely destroyed on the Battle of a Strait of Tsushima. And the reason was completely engineering, so to say, this giant battleships, like the one which is shown on the picture here, had this enormous guns, which were aligned along the boat. So when the battleship wanted to fire a salvo in the direction, in some direction, had to turn into that direction. And uh, then if he, if it wanted, if it, if she wanted to change the uh, direction of a salvo, it, it has to, the, it has 
to change the complete direction of a flow of the battleship. So that was a lengthy and not very precise operation. But the Japanese fleet had the guns mounted in the gun turrets, which were rotating. So the Japanese ships were much better engineered. They were able to fire a salvo in the arbitrary direction with respect to the direction the ship was traveling. And the, this was a, the end of a mighty fleet of the Russian Empire. And it, this military disaster triggered in this imperium, Russian imperium, uh, a revolutionary uh, feelings, but it also had the consequences in the military science. And uh, the British Admiralty realized that it had to completely rebuild its fleet. And that is a picture of a first modern battleship, Dreadnought, which was put into the operation in 1906, a year later. And that was the first British battleship with also rotating uh, gun turrets. And um, actually, this was a uh, the, the dreadnought was a blueprint for a battleship's manufacture until today. And those three giant battleships, which are still being uh, in service of US Navy, are in some sense uh, grand grandchildren of a dreadnought. And uh, uh, the history have shown that the battleship rule in the sea battles uh, has been replaced by the aircraft carrier. But that is uh, another, uh, another story. But the other revolution, not only in the military engineering, was a real revolution of a 1905. And it started on the 22nd January with the, with the so-called Bloody Sunday in St. Petersburg, where this individual, a, a, a Orthodox uh, priest, uh, Gapun, led the thousands of uh, uh, workers and inhabitants of St. Petersburg in a very peaceful demonstration towards the winter palace uh, of a Tsar. And this demonstration was encountered by the uh, police, uh, horse police of the Tsar Cossacks, so-called Cossacks. The name didn't have anything to do with the real Cossacks living on the Don River, which fire the live ammunition to the crowds and the lots of people get killed and, and uh, injured during these events. And with that, a tremendous revolution happened in the old empire. And uh, one of the outcome of it was the, the only successful rebellion against the occupation forces at that time in Poland, which starts in the 28th of January, and which was called a school strike. That was a rebellion which was started at the Warsaw Technical University by a group of people. And one of the leaders of that group was Marian Falski, who is the founding father of a modern thinking about the education in Poland. Marian Falski was not only the leader of a school strike, but he also in the 20s had written a, a introductory book for children when they start to read and write, which we called elementary book. And that elementary book was in use until 
essentially uh, almost a year when he died. And um, the people of my age and the older and well, also the, my son, for example, we all have learned how to read and write from the book of Marian Falsky. And the school strike was a strike in the Russian part, Russian occupied part of Poland, which success, was successful and the Polish language schools were permitted to open after that strike. But in addition to the school strike, there was also a, a real revolution happening in uh, Poland. And if you will cross the river in Warsaw, then next to the zoo in Warsaw, you, there is a street named after the Stefan Okshea, who was a revolutionary, a worker who blew up a police prison of the Tsar police in Warsaw. And that was the outcome of a, uh, of a Bloody Wednesday of the uh, 5th of the August of that time. So the big part of Europe uh, had been uh, uh, shaken by a revolution which was happening in the in the Russia at the time. Uh, these are two pictures which I managed to find for uh, from that period of time. This is a photograph from Warsaw. Courier Warszawski was a, was a, was a journal. And uh, this is the picture from the town of Watch. And here you can see these uh, individuals in white uniforms. They were a uh, horse riding a uh, police. And um, there is a scientific story related to that police. Those policemen were known for spending hours on the horses, sitting on the horses and holding the sabers, specially made sabers for, uh, to be used as a, instead of a police trenches as today, to disperse the crowd. And they were holding those uh, sabers in their hands. And for years, people were thinking how it is possible that they can do this for so many hours. And it turns out that those sabers had been having a, a, a very intelligent trick, engineering trick, which made that the center of weight for those sabers was below the, the place on which they hold it. So they didn't had a, any serious force exerted on their wrist by holding those weapons. And that trick, is nowadays used by the engineers making the uh, tennis rackets in order to prevent from the injury of the elbows. So modern tennis rackets are much less uh, uh, dangerous from the viewpoint of uh, uh, injury of elbow, which is called the tennis elbow. But, and that is the uh, the, the that was the Sabre's construction. Anyway, that so the Russian Empire, the a giant uh, influencer of the policy in Europe at the time was shaken by the revolution. So let's see what else has happened in the world. And let's see what happens with the Nobel Prizes in 1905. And in 1905, a Polish writer, Henryk Sienkiewicz, had gotten his Nobel Prize for a life achievement. I underline that life achievements because it is often confused, particularly in Poland. It is said that he got his Nobel Prize for a book for Vadis he wrote, but that's not true. The, the Nobel Prize is for his life achievement. And the Nobel Prize in Physics had been given to an individual, Philip Leonard, for a cathode ray experiment. Cathode rays were actually very hot 
subject of research at the time. And um, Philip Leonard was a true leader in those experiments. We will come back to the name of Philip Leonard in what follows. But the important thing is that the Philip Leonard, in fact, had discovered a photoelectric effect. And uh, uh, the photoelectric effect was a part of a annus mirabilis, but not due to the Philip Leonard, but due to the one item written at the time by certain Albert Einstein, we will be talking about it in a moment, but Leonard uh, life and activities were closely related to the Einstein for a Leonard being a great scientist was actually incredibly bad human. He had been one of the leaders of a that part of the intellectual uh, of uh, Germany who willingly joined the Nazi party under Hitler. He was a top in physicist, so to say, and together with another German Nobel Prize with name Stark, you might encounter or you may solve the problems related to the Stark effect. In, uh, in the course of quantum mechanics. And those two individuals are authors of what used to be called the German physics, the Deutsche Physik, uh, an attempt to write a, a science uh, in such a way as to make it clean from any influence and any achievements done by the scientists of a Jewish uh, origin. So they were also against the uh, Einstein relativity theory. And uh, Leonard was such a stunt um, follower of a Hitler and Nazi that he accepted a giant award of a Nazi science in the March of 1945 when the Russian army was basically approaching the Berlin and the American and allies forces were occupying already the west of Germany. And Leonard was accepting this Nazi award from a hand of the chief ideologist of the Nazi party, Mr. Rosenberg. And uh, Leonard died in the 45 uh, in disgrace in some village somewhere in Germany. So that was the, a tremendous scientific event anyway, the Nobel Prize in 1995. And what the people reading the science pages in daily journals of the time could read. Here are the pages from, um, I believe the left one is from um, uh, 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 time of London, and um, as uh, as this is a story about the cosmical physics, and there are particular um, sentences which I underline and read. Uh, this is a report of a, in a journal about the lecture of a uh, Svante Arrhenius. Svante Arrhenius was at the time in one of the greatest scientists, particularly of the Scandinavian origin. And he says that Dr. Rezenius devoted his address to emphasizing the intimate relationship of all the sciences above mentioned above themselves and with others. For instance, meteorology was closely connected with the amount of a, and watch that, amount of a carbonic acid gases in the atmosphere which now remains non-constant, but had the quantity always been constant. If it had fallen much greater, how had plant lived? We are now talking all the time about the 
rule played by the carbon dioxide and, and all those gases, which we call the greenhouse gases like the methane and the, and the nitrogen, oxygens and so forth. And the fact that they played incredibly important role in the behaving of atmosphere, the climate of our earth was already well known at the turn of a century. And um, it's worthwhile to think about it, how come that it was maybe not overlooked, but completely ignored for a better part of the 20th century uh, and the consequences of it we were now facing. And uh, this, I believe, is from some, uh, I, 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 I don't know, it's in your Herald Tribune, I believe. I'm sorry I should have written that. I have it somewhere in the notes. So anyway, and that another story which people could read in the newspaper was a Marconi station in Canada and Newfoundland. Marconi Wireless Telegraph Company has received intimidation from the Marconi Wireless Telegraph Co Company of Canada that the installation of the Marconi equipped wireless telegraph station at Sable Island and Halifax under contraction with the Canadian government has just been completed and that these two stations are now in the full operation. The world was changing because of the wireless, which means radio, had become something which was commonly used. Roughly at the time, a first uh, time signal, uh, we, were, we were talking about the rule of a time uh, on the previous lecture, the first time signal was broadcast from the radio station located on the Eiffel Tower in Paris. All right. And finally, the 1905 Annus Mirabilis is related to, the, to that gentleman, Albert Einstein. Yeah, well, there's a tremendous mistake, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> he was born in 1879, not 1979. And it is fashionable to always give some quotation from Einstein or show the picture of him on a bicycle or this famous picture with his mouth open and, and so forth. So I choose the other one. It's a statement of Einstein. If I had known all this first, I would have become a locksmith. Albert Einstein was a, a German Jew born in Ulm in the 1879. And uh, very quickly he uh, had left Germany and um, he decided that after the school years, he wanted to continue education at the Swiss uh, famous technical university, the Eidgenossische Technische Hochschule in, uh, in, uh, in Zurich. The ETH is, uh, was at that time one of the leading schools in, uh, in the world, and it is still one of a very few uh, European universities which managed to be in the first uh, uh, or well, say 15 uh, universities in the world in those more or less nonsensus, but anyway, very popular rankings of the university. The ETH was also a school which uh, accepted the students without a formal document, which was at the time almost obligatory at all the lycees in Europe and remains uh, in, uh, for example, in Poland, uh, it was a final exam 
which we in Poland call Matura. And uh, ETH accepted students without that document, uh, only by examining the skills and knowledge of those candidates. So Einstein decided to continue education at ETH and he went to that school and uh, one of the professors who examined him and actually accepted him as a student of ETH suggested to uh, uh, Einstein that he should uh, actually go for a year to a decent school in Switzerland and to complete the final year of his education at the, uh, at the Swiss school. And Einstein went to the school in Arau. Arau was at that time a town slightly, I mean, next to Zurich, but uh, it is now basically a suburb or a part of Zurich. And he joined the Arau school in 1895. And this is a picture of his colleagues from that school. This is Albert Einstein. Uh, they don't look on that picture as a, as a high school kids, uh, but that was the way at that time. What this Arrow School actually had made intellectual life of Einstein the way it was through all of his scientific activities. This was one of the so-called neo or post pestalochi schools. Uh, Switzerland was uh, tremendously affected by the wars during Napoleon time. That was uh, because from the east, it, there was the army of a Russian Marshal Suvorov, which went through half of the Switzerland slaughtering people. And from the West, there was an army of a Marshal Massena, one of the Napoleon generals, which did the same. And they, there was a giant battle uh, between those two armies. And as a result of those events, Switzerland had an incredible number of uh, children without the families. And there was a, 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 a clergyman and a mystic with the name Pestalochi, who was organizing uh, schools for orphans in Switzerland at the time of the Napoleon Wars. And he, is, he was a creator of a, a certain view on how the education should look like, which I think is extremely modern. And uh, uh, we would have been in a much better shape if the contemporary education system, this general education system all over the world will follow more closely the Pestalochi ideas. His, one of his uh, leading mottos was that uh, the school is teaching a child, not the subject. And um, the, there are lots of schools still in Switzerland, which are this post Pestalochi style school and Arrow was one of those schools. And the, there were lots of education of humanities in the school and the, all these physics activity and the scientific activities of Einstein had been always very close to the, those sciences we are now called uh, humanities. And that was a consequences of a school in Arrow. After he finished the school in Arrow, he went to the ETH. He completed the education there. And um, he did not qualify, unfortunately, for staying at the ETH as a research assistant. And he found that he got the job at the uh, patent office of Switzerland in the town of Bern, the capital of Switzerland. 
and uh, he became a clerk of a third degree in uh, in Bern, and uh, 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 that that was a time where his family life was uh, undergoing uh, rapid changes. We will be talking about in a second, but when in Bern with his colleagues, he set up a kind of a discussion club, which, called, which was called Olympia Academy. And there are these founding members of it. This is the Albert Einstein, this is a Konrad Habicht and Maurice Solovine. And uh, it is remarkable that those gentlemen hardly see each other after uh, 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 Einstein left uh, Switzerland and went to the uh, went to the Germany, but they kept through all the life of Einstein uh, in contact by mail. There is a lots of letters exchange between those individuals, and they discuss the science uh, also uh, together. But uh, as I said, the Einstein finished the ETH in Zurich. And um, if you will be ever in uh, Zurich, uh, you can take a, a funicular from the lower station, which is close to railroad station and close to the Rimat K, the, 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 the bank in the river Limat, which is in the center of Zurich, and you can take it up the hill to the station on the Remistrasse, where the headquarters of the old ETH, it has moved out of Zurich in the modern times and has a fantastic futuristic campus out of Zurich. But there are old buildings of ETH in the, and uh, historical building, which are still being used by ETH. Uh, in on the Remistrasse, and if you will go there, then in the main hall, you will see that at the time when Einstein was there, the one of the professors of ETH was a Gabriel Narutovic. Gabriel Narutovic was electric construction engineer. He was building up the power station, electric power station in Switzerland at the time. And uh, after the first war, he had returned to Poland and he became a first elected president of Polish Republic who was shot and killed two few days after he was sworn in office by a radical uh, nationalistic painter. Uh, and that was the tremendous blow to freshly reborn Polish Republic. And uh, there's a slight monument of Gabriel Narutowicz in this old building of ETH. And if you will be then going downward, downhill from that building to back to the, to the Limat K, you, you, you can walk over a, a, a small street called Auf der Mauer, and then you will see another uh, interesting from Polish side, from Polish viewpoint, uh, uh, little plaques on the on the on the building, in which Marshal Piłsudski was living when he was in exile in, in Zurich, and the other building where the uh, uh, Mr. Wojciechowski, who was uh, uh, elected the president of Poland after Rarutowicz was killed, who also was living there at Zurich, was. Uh, was a, a kind of a hub of all those uh, foreigners who had not been able to, for political reasons, to live in their own countries. And uh, there, on the other side of Limat in Zurich, there is a house in which Lenin was living and so forth. But anyway, the Olympia Academy was set up. And uh, uh, this is a period of time. On the left side, you see the face, the picture of uh, Albert Einstein and his first wife, Milena Maric. Uh, she was a, a, a 
as also a student at ETH. And there are also these stories about the uh, marriage contribution to the mathematics of uh, Einstein work. And um, they had uh, two sons, and they also had most probably a daughter. And the story of that daughter is, uh, is uh, somehow confused, and it's not clear whether there was really that child. But in any case, they had two sons. One of the sons was, uh, was later on a, a very accomplished professor of uh, harbor building and giant hydraulics in the United States in California. And uh, the other one was uh, unfortunately mentally unstable and spent most of his life in the mental asylum. This is a picture of a room of Einstein on the Kirchgasse in Bern, where I was living. And what is on the right is a picture of Albert Einstein and his visit to the United States uh, after the general theory of relativity, when he becomes somewhat uh, like um, somehow uh, 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 well, a very, very famous person. I mean, the, and um, he is here with his uh, second wife. And uh, in the middle, there's a uh, Charlie Chaplin. And uh, Einstein was uh, a kind of a tabloid hero at that, at that, at that time. So let's. And in the 1905, this uh, he he defended his PhD thesis, and his PhD thesis was published a year later in 1906. So, strictly speaking, it cannot be included into this annus mirabilis avalanche of scientific papers published by Einstein. Uh, but let before I will mention those papers, let's discuss a certain course of historical scientific events which led to this annus mirabilis. In uh, 1873, Scottish mathematician Maxwell had written a Maxwell equations. And as you know, the Maxwell equations and the theory of electrodynamics, which started with those equations, is the most important uh, event in our civilization. Uh, essentially, most of the, I mean, it, it was the, Maxwell equations made the prediction, this prophecy by Faraday true. When the Faraday was laboratory was visited by Lord Gladstone, he looked at these experiments of Faraday with the with the with the magnet coils moving in a magnetic field and generating electricity and so forth. And he asked Faraday, uh, uh, Mr. Faraday, what is it all for? And the Faraday answer, well, I have no idea unless this one, that one of your uh, followers will be collecting taxes for that. And that is uh, true. Most of the taxes we are now paying, we are paying for the use of electricity. And therefore, the Maxwell equations are, are those equations which make the uh, Faraday prophecies true. Uh, a year later, as a certain gentleman, Stoney, he estimated what is the value of the electron charge. And uh, a few years later, uh, a Hall effect was discovered. And Maxwell also suggested the experiment, which today is called the Michelson Morley experiment, but he only suggested it. He didn't tell how it, that should be performed. And two years later, Michelson attempted to measure the ether drift. Uh, 
because even Maxwell, he taught that the electromagnetic waves are propagating in a certain medium called ether, which was weightless and penetrated all the universe. And that was the medium in which this transverse electromagnetic waves are propagating. And that there are those electromagnetic waves was experimentally shown by Hertz in 1887. And uh, uh, the same year, the Hertz claims that the light is somehow related to the electric discharge. And uh, Halvax have shown that this is the consequence of freeing electrons from a metal by light. That was the first experiment on the photoelectric effect which later on was carried much in much bigger detail by the Leonard and others, and which eventually lead to the Einstein work on the photoelectric effect. And finally, we had the Michelson-Morley experiment. And parallel to it, in 1895, Konrad Rendgen discovered what we now call the X-rays or Rentgen radiation. And yet, yet year, a year later, Lawrence and had uh, suggested atoms contain moving electrons. And the Zeeman measured the ratio of electron charge to the mass of the electron. And a year later, independently Thomson and German physicist Kaufman and Fischer, they measure with much better accuracy the ratio of electric charge to the mass of the electron. And two years later, Thomson by himself me measured the charge of electron independently of its mass. 1900, Lorentz, Leonard had made his photoelectric uh, effects uh, measurements. And in the same time, Kaufman measure energy of a very fast electrons moving in a magnetic field. And these experiments were extremely important because when they suggested that somehow the mass of the electron moving very fast depends on its velocity. And the Kaufman experiments even give a formula for it. And that formula was in contradiction to what Einstein predicted. And it was for a quite a while used as an argument against the special theory of relativity. But Kaufman was extremely good physicist and eventually he corrected his experiments and he verified a special theory of relativity. All right. And uh, one of the problems of that time, which was of the very important was that if the electromagnetic waves, and that means light, are propagating as excitations of ether, then how come that the velocity of those waves do not depend on the velocity of the earth on which we measure? And the two American scientists, Michelson and Morley, had built up a, a device Michelson Morley interferometer, with which they may were able to measure whether the velocity of a light in ether depends on the velocity with which Earth moves through this supposedly existing ether. And as you know, the Michelson an, uh, experiment, which was 19, 1887, have shown that there is no dependence 
and that the velocity of light does not depend on the velocity of earth. And therefore, it has shown that the velocity of light seems to be the constant of nature. All right. So finally, it's the Einstein, 1905. In that year, he published a barrage of scientific papers, all of them published in the, at that time, a leading scientific journal in physics, Annalen, Annalen der Physik. And the first one was event on the heuristic point of view concerning the production and transformation of light. That is the paper, the second paper was uh, uh, on the movement of a small particle suspended in stationary liquids required by the molecular theory of heat. The third one, that was the blockbuster on the electrodynamics of moving bodies. And the fourth paper was, does the inertia of a body depends upon its energy content? That was, uh, that was the paper uh, which he had forgotten, a, a few calculations which he had forgotten to include in the paper number three. So that paper is a paper on the photoelectric effect and Albert Einstein got the Nobel Prize for that particular paper in 1921. He did not get the Nobel Prize for relativity theory. He got it for a photoelectric effect. And that is how the life achievement of Philip Leonard has joined with the achievement of Einstein and that this is impossible to discuss the photoelectric effect history without those two individuals, although they differ completely in the, the moral, ethical, and political uh, stand. This is a paper which was the beginning of the theory of a Brownian motion. And uh, completely independently from Einstein, this topic was studied by the Polish scientist Marian Smolchowski, who was a professor at the University of in Vienna and later on in Krakow, on the, in Poland. And unfortunately, Smolchowski died uh, much earlier. Uh, but now we know that the theory of a Brownian motion and the concept of it, uh, as proposed by Smolchowski, are much more ground, I, I mean, they are much more, they are correct as, and the Einstein theory is uh, having some flaws in it. Uh, this is, as I said, the blockbuster. This is a paper in which the special theory of relativity was formulated. And that small paper is the paper in which something which is called the most important formula in physics has been derived, namely that E is equal to MC square. Uh, what I would like to show you here is the, is the copy of the, uh, this paper on electrodynamics of moving bodies through electrodynamic by vector Kerber. And that is a remarkable paper, paper which uh, hardly has any formulas in it. And uh, that was how the special theory of relativity was established. And that uh, Einstein had written many papers on it. And that is a lecture, copy of a lecture which was given by the by Einstein on the Ether und Relativitätstheorie in 1920. Still, there was necessary uh, uh, 15 years later to explain to the uh, 
people what are what is the special theory of uh, relativity. Uh, but um, the history of special theory of relativity is related to this another scientist, a mathematician, Hermann Minkowski. Hermann Minkowski was Einstein professor of mathematics when Einstein was studying at the ETH in Zurich. And apparently he did not have a very good opinion about the Einstein mathematical abilities. And it, it is now in a general consensus that Einstein wasn't a, a best mathematician out of the people who were working in, a, who were creating a modern physics at the time. And Hermann Minkowski uh, was a mathematician uh, who was born in Alexotti. Alexotti is uh, a town, is a suburb of a Litu Lithuanian town, Kovno, uh, uh, which at that time was in the Russian Empire. And um, he uh, unfortunately died pretty soon after the theory of relativity in 1909, he, uh, he did not survive a surgery, which nowadays is extremely simple, namely the removal of appendices. Well, why I mentioned Minkowski? Because when Minkowski learned about the Einstein theory, he had immediately realized that its formulation can be cast into a geometrical picture of a four-dimensional world. We have been talking about the four-dimension geometry in the, on the previous lectures, but here the Minkowski had figured out that he can formulate very neatly uh, Einstein special theory of relativity by casting it in the form of a geometry of a four dimension space, but that four dimension space is non Riemannian. Its metric is not positively defined. And that is because this four dimension world of Minkowski consists of a three-dimensional world and time. And uh, the picture which is here which is, is an artist impression of a Minkowski space, which is divided into the regions by the light cone, the past and future light cone, and the bluish lines are the trajectories of the massive particles, which cannot exceed the velocity of light. Therefore, they have to be all within this cones. Uh, this is the Minkowski theory, a formulation of a Minkowski space geometry, was uh, publicly announced by Minkowski on a lecture of a, a certain a scientific meeting in Cologne. And uh, this was actually a, all essentially a meeting of a pharmacist. And that is a page from that, uh, from that uh, paper. And as you see, it has here the Minkowski diagrams, which explain the Lorentz transformations and and uh, and uh, relation between the geometry of a, depending on the velocity of motion of the observer. And uh, I here here happened to get from somewhere the copies of the original drawings, hand drawings by Minkowski, and. Uh, as you, as you know from the course of special theory of relativity, the Minkowski space have the structure of these two cones, light cones, 
And what you see here is a, 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 a sculpture called Broken Obelisk by Barnett Newman. Uh, it is located in the Museum of Modern Art of New York, which according to the author, seems to be this two cones of light and uh, whether this is really good visualization, that is another story. Uh, relative, special relativity, and I am making an assumption that all of you are familiar with it, has become rapidly uh, extremely exciting for a uh, rest of educated part of the human, humankind at that time. It penetrates the art, particularly literature. And I am showing you only two examples. It's, uh, a, there was a physicist in Poland, Antoni Swojciński, who was an assistant at the University of Warsaw of a Professor Białobrzewski. Professor Białobrzewski was a, one of the first physicists in Poland who was lecturing on Einstein theory. And Swojciński, for reasons, uh, had quit physics at a certain time, and he joined a theater life in Poland and was an author of many uh, uh, theater plays, some of them having, well, maybe I should say most of them, having some kind of a relation to a science. And in 1934, he had written a play called Einstein Theory. And uh, he also had written uh, a, a play, which was a comedy, The Freud Theory of Sleep and uh, many others. And uh, uh, the relativity starts to attract uh, the theater authors even today. Uh, on the right hand side, you see the copy, uh, the picture from a play at the, at the, broad, at the off the Broadway by uh, a play written by Mark Germain in 2017 called Relativity, which is a uh, uh, a, a story about the old Einstein uh, discussing his life and uh, retrospectively, retrospective play. All right. And um, uh, one of the important changes in our understanding of the, uh, how the physics goes on around us, which is a consequence of the special theory of relativity, is the concept of the simultaneity. Uh, that is a cartoon from somewhere I got it. Uh, we have uh, two clouds and two discharges, A and B, and the observer on the earth says, oh, they happen at the same time. And the moving observer uh, in the missile says, no, B was the first. The concept of a simultaneously happening events is, uh, related, is explained in the theory of relativity by Lorentz transformations. And what is on the right-hand side of this is just to refresh your memory, uh, expressions of a Lorentz contraction of a length measured and the time dilatation, which is on the uh, below. Well, that means that the simultaneity effect are depending on the velocity of observers and what happens to be simultaneous for one observer is not simultaneous for the other. Uh, but at the same time, the artists, uh, painters were struggling 
with an attempt to show this on a two dimensional picture, I still ask you to remember the definition. The painting is an illusion of a d dimensional world on a two dimensional plane. And uh, what you see on the left is a painting by Marcel Duchamp, one of the important painters and artists of a turn of a centuries. And this title of that painting is a nude descending the staircase. And this is an attempt to show simultaneously all the phases of emotion of that character walking down the stairs. And uh, we will be seeing the name of Duchamp appearing very often in what follows. But on the right, I show you again a stained glass from this Franciscaner church in Krakow, which is the godfather creating the earth. And as I already told you, Vispiansky, this is a, this is a picture of Stanislaw Vispiansky. The Vispiansky had also had attempted to show all the events, biblical events of a creation of a word, all these biblical events on the same picture. So it was the artists were desperately trying to show the similar uh, on a picture, the events which have not been simultaneously, in fact, to show the, all the time events on the same picture. And um, uh, the concept of simultaneity was also bothering a writers. And uh, what you see here is uh, the statue of James Joyce, which um, uh, from, well, from all possible places is on so-called the Harzer Square in, in Kielce, the town on the, on the south of Warsaw. And uh, there's a picture of, of, uh, of James Joyce. He's of course well known for this incredible book called the Ulysses, but he also had written another extremely important book and which is even more difficult to read than the Ulysses, namely the Finnegan's Way. And in a Finnegan's Wake is actually a story which happens in no time. The first and the last sentence of that book are related. The first line of the, uh, of the book reads like this. And the last line is the beginning of it. So the book is in between the end and the beginning, but the end and beginning are just the part of the same sentence. A way along of a last laughed long along the river run past Eve and Adams and so forth and so forth. So the James Joyce in the Finnegan's Wake was desperately trying to also analyze the concept of the simultaneity. By the way, the Finnegan's Wake is also the book from which Mary Galman had taken the word quark. One of the events in the book happens on the, in a harbor and there's a says person shouting, three quarks for Mr. Mark. And, uh, developing a theory of quarks. And Gelman decided to call those objects he introduced, those par building blocks out of which the hadrons are constructed. He called them 
quarks. So the concept of a simultaneity had been uh, very intriguing, uh, something which was very obvious and simple in the theory of Newton. It had become a complicated concept in the special theory of relativity and various authors were trying to help the not mathematically educated individuals to comprehend this change of the concept of a simultaneity. And one of them was a very famous uh, physicist, George Gamow, the person who had invented the, uh, the, the word, the concept of a big bang. And uh, he had written many popular science book one of them is a Mr. Tompkins in the Wonderland, all are about Mr. Tompkins. And this is a cartoon from that picture, uh, from that book, which uh, there is a world in which the velocity of light is slightly smaller, much, much smaller than the velocity of light in the, our universe. And here is the picture, uh, to Mr. Tompkins is watching another individual on a bicycle. And this is this most confusing picture in Mr. Tompkins. He's had the bad consequences because lots of people think that this Lorentz trans contraction, which is given by that formula, is actually resulting in the fact that if this bicyclist moves at the velocity which is compared to the velocity of light, who will be shortened. And that is unfortunately misunderstanding of the concept of simultaneity. Uh, and uh, we have to discuss it in a certain details. So if the painters actually really wanted to paint a simultaneously something, the, simul the, the picture which will describe the whole time process on the one piece of canvas, they had to first ask themselves, what does the observer see? Well, we have an observer and uh, we have an object. And what does that mean that the observer sees the object? That means that the observer and his brain, and I neglect and in the discussion, this slight delays, which uh, are caused by differences in the different elements of our eyes and the speed of nerve propagation, that is something which we are completely irrelevant for the discussion. And what it means observation is that the radiation, which is either emitted or scattered from that object, from each of the points on that object, arrive at the same time to our eyes. So the photon which arrives here travels shorter distance than the photon arrives here. And since they are all moving at the same velocity, so if they, have, if they arrive at my eye at the same time, that means that this particular photon was emitted earlier. And if that object is moving with a certain velocity, which I shown here as this red arrow, that means that if I want to reconstruct a picture of a moving object, observe it, then I have to think about the photons which have been emitted from the object at a different time. So they carry the information 
about the different points of the object. And uh, that was how Mr. Tompkins was in, uh, envisaged it, and that's wrong. And that is the proper way. That's again a picture of Mr. Einstein on the bike. That's how Mr. Gamow thought that should look, but that it how it looks in reality. In reality, if the object moves towards me, then the combined effect of the Lorentz transformations is that the observation of the object, which is the registration of the photons, which carry the information from the object to my eye and arrive at my eye at the same time, is actually a turn around. And that is even better shown here. You have a, a sphere and if you will be ir incorrectly describe the observation of it using a special theory of relativity, that it will look like that pancake. But in fact, it is just a turnaround sphere and, uh, uh, and uh, that's another story. And we have a beautiful experimental verification that this is actually the case. And that is the radiation emitted from a moving charge. A moving electric charge emits the electromagnetic radiation. And that electromagnetic radiation is of, in, the, in the rest frame of the moving electron is completely symmetric. But if we look at the radiation emitted from the moving electron in the laboratory, we see that it is beam forward towards the direction of the motion of the electron. And that is precisely what we will see in that, on that picture. So here is a cartoon of a very fast automobile moving on a relativistic superhighway. And a question, how the observer standing on the sidewalk will see it. And this, this is a, a photograph taken by a certain uh, uh, Mr. Paul Thompson in the, in just a year ago or so. Uh, and that is a picture on the highway of the lights. But if we go back to that picture, then for the observer on the sidewalk, uh, very fast moving towards it car will look like a turn around. And therefore, uh, at the speed of light, we will see the back of it. So be careful on a super highway, a relativistic super highway, because if we see the red light from a tail of a car, he's moving towards you, not from you. But whether this statement, which I said now is correct or not, that I leave to you to discuss, for you also know that there is a phenomenon called the redshift in physics. So perhaps before we may see each other next week, you will be uh, uh, discussing this. Uh, I mean, what actually, what kind of lights you will see on this super relativistic super highway from a car moving towards you at the speed similar to the speed of light. Uh, this is a final picture for today. Uh, there is a, a picture by uh, uh, generated, I forgot the name of the individual, if I have it here. No, I mean, this is from, anyway, this is, something. It is a picture of a city which is illuminated by a light at the rest frame on the street. And how that street will be seen by observer who runs very fast through the street. 
And here you see it's uh, how it will look like for individual rushing into the street. And on the, below, on the picture below is when he is moving out of the street. So you see what kind of a complication to the attempt to project uh, the real motion in the Minkowski space will have an artist who wanted to paint the relativistic simultaneous events like Duchamp or, uh, or uh, Vespiansk. But they were not aware of the relativity theory. They, they thought the day pictures are the simultaneous picture in the Newton concept of space and time. Uh, I believe that is uh, and that is um, that is enough for today. And thanks for being with me. The lecture is recorded, as I said already, and uh, uh, the, we see each other next week. And then we will have a break for uh, one of the Thursday is the 11th of November, and that is national holiday in Poland. So we will have no lecture on the 11th of November, if I, unless I have made a mistake. No, no, this is correct. That's a Thursday. So see you next week, and thanks for being with me today. Bye-bye.